Before we get started, first off, we are so excited to see what's happening in this woman's study. So if you guys, single, married, young, old, um, we're meeting once a week on Saturdays, and it's just kind of like this good fellowship. It's like it's a good way to just be a part, girl stuff, whatever you guys do. I don't know. But they're going to be starting this book called Crazy Love by Francis Chan. It's, it's a nice workbook starting um, after the event, I think October 1st, right? Probably the first time we're going to jump into it. The workbook's about $14 to $15. Um, if you can't afford it, just, just let us know. We'll definitely try to figure out a way to help you guys out. But I really want to encourage each one of us, that's a female, to be a part of this. Um, it's so important to just stay connected continually. It's not just one day a week. You know, it's, it's a continual growth. You know, ministry is daily. It's how we live, it's how we wake up, what we eat, what we breathe. It's just God consciousness continually. And um, <clears throat> we'll be having it, I believe, here in this building going forward. <laughs> Gonna be, right? Michelle? Yeah. Marine? Yes. Yeah. Women's study will be here at 11 a.m. 11 a.m. All right, so just and come as you are, come in PJs, whatever you want. Just come in, don't worry about it. Um, second of all, as you guys may know, that we have other churches coming alongside us in this building. You know, our ultimate goal here is to uh, is to really use this building daily. So, if you don't have a home fellowship or a home church on Sundays, I want to encourage you guys to try to attend. Uh, it's, it's, the church is called Spirit of Joy International. You guys met Christian a couple times. He came up here and spoke. Awesome. Him and his pastor are the, are the two main pastors for this church, and. They've come from the LA area, the West Covina, and now they're coming out to Claremont, and now they're home where their hearts have truly been as Upland. And so they'll be here starting um, two weeks ago, going forward, every Sunday at 10 o'clock. Um, so please, if you don't have a home fellowship that, that you do attend, you're more than welcome to come here at 10 o'clock uh, in the spirit of joy, all right? That same group has a Tuesday night woman's discipleship. So if you want some deep, training or deep ministry or deep something, whatever you could call it. But if, if you want something just somewhat deeper and you have a hunger, Tuesdays, probably about 20 women that come together here and the pastor's wife teaches it and it's only, it's only women. And it's a woman's discipleship class, all right? And it's all are welcome. It's such a, that's at 6.30 to 8. 6.30 to 8. Um, <clears throat> does anybody know what's happening? Next Sunday? No. Everyone says no. Community oh, wow. Community our, community our big community outreach that we're doing. Yep. All right? That's next Sunday. And uh, we don't know what's happening. But it's happening. God is just totally moving it, you know? And, and I have to admit that sometimes we, we try so hard with our hands to make it work. And we feel like we're stagnant. We get stuck. And the moment that we say, you know what, God, it's not us, it's you, by your grace, by your mercy, by your power, by your strength, and less of us, God moves. And so, we are moving along. Uh, we can definitely use help. If you have a heart and desire to, to want to help, we can use from, well, first and foremost, we need prayers, continual prayers. That's urgent, urgent, because as we try to do this event, um, there's just so much uh, battles are trying to hold us back. So we need you guys' prayers. And please, sincerely, keep that in your prayer. Don't just say yes and nod your head. I know that feeling. Really pray about it for us. We need that prayer. Um, out on the back table, we created this little sheet of just what's needed still and where we can use help. And, you know, you know I realize that, you know, we're in tough times financially and not everyone could, could really help out financially. But if it's on your heart to donate or be a part of it, we can definitely use it. If not, it's okay. Um, we need volunteers to so just be there. We need prayer groups, people to help set up, break down, be a part of the games, the, festi uh, the festivities, uh, to be a light to these people. And then also um, just to be there, you know? We're expecting probably about 500 to 1,000 people at a minimum coming. And we don't know how or what. That's how God works for us. Always the eleventh hour. I didn't know how we we're gonna get this place, and the last minute, God just provides. And so, 
whether we have just one of us there or our entire staff and five churches there, um, it's going to work out well. But we need you guys' prayer, your support, and we really ask you guys to really just be a part of it and, you know, really grow. Um, I want to make sure that we all understand that, that the focus of this outreach is not for just led by one. God calls each one of us to be the church. And each one of us believers is a part of the body of Christ. And we're called to go out there and minister and be servants and to love. And, you know, ideally, of course, we want each person to grow. And so wherever they're going, just to encourage them, to love them, to help them, whether they're homeless or they're very educated, just be there to help these people out. So if you have a heart or desire to help out, whether it's food or just cleaning or prayer, whatever it is, we can definitely use your help. I just ask that if, if you do put your name on the sheet, just please follow through, okay? We also have these cards, some flyers, and before you guys, please pass them out. Again, our ultimate goal is to provide everything for free for everybody. That's insane. But you know what? We're going to do it. God's going to do it. And so, don't know how yet, but it will happen, all right? So if you want some flowers to pass out, invite your family, friends, people that you don't know. Eric will be leading um, the concert. We're going to have like, a live performance and stuff. I know Eric hates being uh, mentioned, but you know, for the most part, we're all going to try to just, just put our part into it and just really ask at least one thing is your prayers, okay? Please, prayer. Three quick more small things. Uh, Julie, Julie, please stand up for a second. Don't be shy. Julie turns 12 tomorrow, by the way, guys. So afterwards, grab a little small little cake for her, and please be a part of that. Also, what was that? Supposed to be a surprise. Oh, was it? No, it's Oh. No. Oh, okay. Um, sorry for the moon surprise. Also, Hanny should be coming in. He usually pops in the last second. But he turns 28 today. So when you guys talk to him, 28. 28. Um, and then one other announcement is my parents' anniversary is tomorrow. Yeah. And I think it's 42 or 43. 43. 42? 43. 43 years. Wow. Yep. If I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. I'm pretty far behind right now, but yeah, I will definitely be a part of it. Let me ask you this. What's, what's the one thing? What's the one thing that kept you guys together this many years? The Lord kept me together. God, the Lord kept me together. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray, and we'll invite up, you know, over our guests. But if you need a Bible, please raise your hand. Um, we'll do it after we pray. How about that? Let's pray. And Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and humbly, Lord, just looking to you, Father, for direction, for answers, for truth and for ultimately for our life. Father, we thank you for everything that you're giving us, Father. And I pray, Lord, that our hearts are made right before you, Lord. As we, as we get our hearts right with worship, may we truly have true worship with you even now as we go into your word, Lord. I pray for everyone tonight that your Holy Spirit is here, God. That you anoint and willing and you speak through really, Lord. And that you allow us to receive your word truthfully, humbly. God, I thank you for our family and our friends, Lord. I thank you that you're just being a part of this ministry, God, and that you are the true head and that you're truly leading this ministry, not man. And Father, I pray for this event on the 23rd, God. I pray, Lord, that, that you just bind the works of Satan, Lord, and that you allow things to just fall into place and that we don't worry, knowing, Lord, that you are in complete control. Father, we thank you. And we lift this at your feet, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand, say hello to somebody. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Meanwhile, I'm going to ask Gloria to come up here. Tonight's a big topic for each one of us. You want to hear this? Hey, Azar, are you wearing this mic?
family. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Good to see you guys again. Yes. Praise the Lord. Good to see you. You know it's been a while. Uh, yes. Where you been hiding? Huh? Where you hiding? I've been hiding, huh? <laughs> Actually, I've been very, very busy, but uh, never too busy for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. And uh, why don't we go to the Lord real quick. And Father, we come to you tonight thanking you for this night. Thanking you for the opportunity, Lord, to approach your throne this morning through your word. Father, we are so grateful to be your children. And Lord, we ask you to bind Satan, keep him off premises tonight. And may your word go forth, Father, the way you've set it out to go. Less of me, more of you. And Father, open the ears and the hearts and the mind of all that are in the sound of my voice tonight so that they can hear what thus said the Lord. We do love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, Abraham called me up on Saturday, where we actually bumped into each other on Saturday, and he said, Brother, I want you to preach on pride. I said, okay. So we have uh, we had about three, three days notice, but you know, um, it ain't me anyway, it's the Holy Spirit, right? That's right. <coughs> but pride is a, uh, is a very serious topic, and um, first of all, I just want to let you know that the world's definition of pride and God's definition of pride are just opposed. Um, who wants to give me what they think the definition of pride is? Any volunteer? Don't shout at the same time now. The world's version or God's version? Well, give me the world's version. The world's version is... Uh do whatever I want, I'm successful at it, I'm good at it, and I rep hard at it, that's my pride, it's okay. Okay. And you, and you talk about it because you're proud of it. Yeah, you're right. It's, Always it's, it's, about it. Okay. You don't want to take handouts or pity, or right? It's your pride. You're proud of yourself. Mm -hmm. Proud of what you achieve. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, what about God's version? How do you think the Bible defines pride? Stealing God's glory. Stealing God's glory, okay. We're not supposed to be prideful, we're supposed to be humble. We're supposed to be humble, all right. Now is that, how does that play in the world? Humility. Humility, if you're not proud, you're humble, how does the world see you, view you, look at you? Weak. As weak, right? How many? How many of you think that if you're humble, you're weak? Oh no, that's people. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You guys, that was a trick question, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me read the world's definition of pride real quick. The quality or state of being proud, as inordinate self-esteem, and then it says conceit, a reasonable or justifiable self-respect. That's typically what we see in the world, as far as the word of pride is concerned. It says delight or elation arising from some act or possession. In other words, you're proud of your car, or you're proud of scoring a touchdown. Um, you're proud of your, your, your behavior. Now, it says in definition two, proud or disdainful behavior or treatment. Now, that's more in line with the way the Bible portrays it. Ostentatious display. You ever seen guys who score a touchdown and do touchdown dance and ostentatious display? 
Uh, so the world's definition, the first definition that they gave us, the one of high self-esteem, self-esteem. And the biblical definition, let's take a look at some of the things that God, um, oh, let me finish the world's definition. A social pride, the best in a group or class. <laughs> you know, you're the valedictorian of your class, you're proud that you scored higher than everyone else in your test, that kind of thing. All right. In the biblical definition, the Old Testament, 62 times use the word proud or pride in a negative connotation. Um, the, the Lord abhors pride. He hates pride so much that in the seven things that he talks about that he hates, one of those is a proud look. Um, the Some of the negative, negative connotations in the, in the Old Testament are conceit, arrogance, haughtiness. All of those are synonyms, synonyms for the word pride. And I'll tell you, in the Old Testament, one of the most, probably the most sinful acts that ever occurred was with Lucifer. You guys know who Lucifer was? The angel from the fallen angel, the devil? Yep. Who's now called Satan, the devil. What got him kicked out of heaven? Jealousy and pride. Jealousy and pride. Rebellion. See, pride leads to rebellion. And Satan wanted to do what? What was, I'm sorry? He wanted to be like God. He wanted to be like the most high. And what was the word that he used seven times that gets us in trouble every day? He wanted to be, the word was I. I want to be like the most, I will be like the most high. And it was that pride that led to his rebellion and it was his rebellion that got him kicked out of heaven. So as far as God is concerned, pride is the highest of sins. So if we're Christians and we're supposed to be like Christ, but we're supposed to be <coughs> mirror images of Jesus, we want to stay as far away from pride as we can. Amen? Amen. Um, let me talk a little bit about the um, the way we're making up. First of all, let me, let me um, explain that we are in three parts. God is in three parts, right? He has God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Now, we as images of God are also in three parts. What are they? Big part? Mind, soul, spirit, and body. God formed us from the dust of the earth in the body, right? He blew into us his spirit, and that spirit became a living soul. So we have three parts. Now, how does those three parts work? Well, when we're living on this planet, as long as we're in this body and living on this planet, we're susceptible to what goes on in the physical world. So our mind and our soul are the first contact. Those are the things that work in our body. It's what we're in contact with the world. So when we hear things in our mind and it seeps down into our soul, it's dangerous because the ultimate is to allow that evilness or wickedness to seep down into your, your spirit, which is where your heart is. And Proverbs 3 also says that with, above all else, guard your heart. So I want to explain that because when you start to read the text about pride in the Bible, the number one no-no is to allow pride to seep into your heart. So when you're envying someone, something, and you're letting that thought 
germinate in your mind, into your soul, what are you supposed to do when you, when you come up against that, that thought? Block it out. That's right. You're supposed to cut it off, walk away, cast down that thought and replace it with what? With what? Oh, that's perfect. With good report, things that are of good report. Because we want to keep that prideful thought from germinating in our hearts. So that's what gets most of the, the people in the Old Testament in, in, in trouble. If you look at a lot of the kings in, in, like Hezekiah and those people that were kings, the number one thing they had to do is protect their heart. So being Christians, we have a uh, we have a a obligation to walk in the spirit. If we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walking in the spirit means that we're seeing things the way God sees things. Okay? And the world, as we just saw, they see things the totally opposite as we do it when it comes to pride. So according to the biblical way of pride, there's one thing we do need to be prideful in. What is that? Somebody said it. God. The ways of God. <laughs> Amen? So, if we can keep that mindset that we're proud of our ways and walking in the spirit, walking in love, walking in humility, gentleness, kindness, patience, all those things, we can be proud in walking in the ways of the Lord. But we According to Philippians, we can do nothing without who? Without Jesus. But through Jesus, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. So if we're going to take pride in anything, we're going to take pride in our walk in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So that's what we're all about, walking in, taking pride in Jesus. Now, what does pride look like in our daily life? So if, we, if we're walking around proud, right? And amongst our family members, how does that affect your relationship <coughs> with your siblings or your mother or your father? If you're walking around arrogant and in a prideful state, putting yourself first over others, which is the opposite of what Jesus talks about in Philippians 2a. He talks about humility, putting others before yourself. So what does it look like when you're at home and let's say you're at dinner, we talked about this before, you only got one big piece of chicken, right? And you take the big piece of chicken before your spouse or before your siblings, how does that look? It, it causes friction. <coughs> Discord. Resentment. Resentment. Uh, Big pardon? So my, my point is, is we all know what that looks like. And it takes an effort to be able to put someone else before yourself. When you, you go out, and like we talked about earlier, you achieve something, and you start boasting about your achievements. What is that doing to the person that you're, your, your relationship with the person that you're dealing with? Your, your mother, your, your spouse, your siblings, your friends your co-workers, if we could just be a fly on the wall and look at ourselves, how we communicate with one another in, in, in that regard, with, with regard to the pride at home and, it, and even at church, we can see that pride is the number one culprit that causes friction in these relationships. So above all else, we want to make sure that we're walking in a state of humility. The scripture tells us that pride, 16, 18, God tells us that pride comes before the fall. You've heard that before? Yeah, it comes before the fall. It comes before destruction. So if, it's, a, it's an actual uh, a spiritual law that you cannot uh, get around. If you're walking in pride, eventually you're going to fall. 
And the reason for, the reason for that is because you're working, walking in your own strength and not the strength of the Lord. If you have a Bible style, turn to James 4, 6 for me real quick. Four six. Let me show you the power of the opposite of pride, which is humility. Okay, go ahead. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. And he says, more grace. Now, the definition of grace is what? Undeserving gift. Undeserving gift, kindness, favor. Unmerited favor, something that you didn't earn, right? Right. So if you didn't, you couldn't earn it, how could you get more of it? He says here, God gives more grace to the humble. How, how could you get more grace if you didn't deserve it? It's a trick question. The, the answer is, is that you being humble, you remove yourself, you submit yourself to the Lord. You get out of the way, and he will exalt you in due season. In other words, it's God's power working and not you. So the only way that you can get truly humble is to submit yourself to the Lord. Read the next uh, verse there for me, Mark. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Right. So, instead of walking around with your chest out and being proud of what you've achieved, you humble yourself to the Lord, you submit to the Lord, and he will actually exalt you. Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. There's a reason for that. Because God's power is at work. So, we want to avoid pride at all cost and do whatever we have to do to become humble servants of the Lord. Turn to Philippians 2.8 real quick. Let's, let's see what that humility looks like. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Uh, actually, why don't we, uh, why don't you go to um, Philippians 2, 1, and read down. Okay, Philippians 2, 1. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem, each up, esteem others be better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, 
taking the form of a bondservant and coming in, in the likeness of men <coughs> and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Amen. Amen. That's good. So, Jesus, if we're to imitate Christ, Jesus tells us do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Now that's kind of difficult, right? Especially when uh, you have needs. Excuse me, guys. Got to get used to this, Abe. So, um, Imagine being Jesus Christ, who's God. He was a God from eternity past. He was with God when God created the earth. He, he, in fact, God created all things through him. And he came down to earth in the form of a man, a lowly man. Not only did he come into earth as a lowly man, but he humbled himself even to death on the cross. He died on the cross, the worst kind of death imaginable during that time. He humbled himself because of the love for you and me. And as a result of that humility, God raised him to the highest point there is. And I want you to look at that as an example for ourselves. If we imitate God, in our walk, in our daily walk, we avoid pride. We avoid putting ourselves first. We put others before ourselves. We actually make sacrifices for others. When it comes to money, when it comes to food, when it comes to things, you know, instead of going out and buying dresses and things that make us look good, men, suits, and so forth, how about taking some of that money and giving it to the poor? How about taking your food, as Jesus has instructed us to do, and feed the poor? How about taking money to kids that don't have shoes or don't have clothing? How about widows who lost a husband? They don't have money now. This is, these are the priorities that God puts in our lives. Instead of going out and making ourselves look proud, make, you know, making sure that we have all our needs met and don't care about the other person. Do you know that God says, if you give, it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together. Man should give unto your bosom. There's a law at work there. There's a law with pride and there's a law with humility that works the same way. So what we're talking about tonight is avoiding pride and going toward humility. Now I know that sounds like it's just ludicrous, to not be proud of yourself, not to be proud of the things that you do, the achievements that you make, the money that you have, your possessions. Where did those things come from? God. They came from God, didn't they? Yes. Who believes that? The money that you work for every day, you, you're hard at work, working eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, you earn that paycheck, right? Oh. Right? Didn't you earn that money? Yeah. Is that your money? Whose money is it? God's. It belongs to God. That's a different mindset than the world. Folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, we need to understand that God can do all things through us. He has a plan for your life. He has a plan for our lives. But we have to be obedient to his word. And his word tells us to put others before ourselves and to walk in a humble state and not in pride. So I'm here to talk to you tonight simply to tell you that I know it's difficult to see things this way. But we, we have to put others before ourselves, as Jesus did. You know, it was tough for Jesus. If you, uh, if you would uh, just remember when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had an opportunity to not go through with God's plan. It was difficult. He could already see and I think a lot of times we don't, re we don't realize the pain that he went through, not just the physical pain, but he had to go through 
taking on all the sin of the world on that moment on the cross. So he knew this in advance. He knew that all of the sin that ever was and ever will be was going to come upon him. But yet, he went through with it. The Bible tells us that he was in such agony that he was sweating blood. And that's a lot of agony. And all the sin of the world came on him, but the thing that probably got, got to him the most is when God the Father, who had never ever, he had never been separated from, ever, when he cried out to the Lord, the Lord turned his back on him. I was a lonely feeling. But he knew that in, in advance, that that thing was going to take place. He got rid of every single ounce of pride in his body. He humbled himself in that situation. And as a result of that, God raised him from the dead gave him a new body, same body that we're going to get, and placed him on high. And that's exactly what we need to look at ourselves in imitating God. <laughs> so the, the lesson for the night is to avoid pride, being prideful, arrogant, conceit. When you're in these, these um, arguments with your siblings or with your parents or with your coworkers, remember pride is a spirit. It's a spirit from the enemy, Satan. It's a, it, it, you know, it's a spirit that's telling you that this person is trying to get over on you. This person is, is uh, not deserving like you are. You're better than this person. That voice, that spirit is of Satan. That is not of God. Amen? Amen. So when, what do you do when, you, when, when a... When a uh, thought comes into your mind that is not of God. What are you supposed to do? You block it out. Beg part? You block it out. You block it out. How do you block it out, Rich? Through the honor of God. Beg part? Through the honor of God. Through the honor of God. Pray out prayer. Pray. Turn to 2 Corinthians uh, 10 35. Show you what we're supposed to do. Second Corinthians ten thirty. Sometimes, sometimes I get my Corinthians mixed up. Hang on. Is it First Corinthians? Okay. First Corinthians. Right. Thank you very much. On either. Hang on. We'll get there. We'll find it. Somebody got some uh, music they can play. Hang on. Uh, okay. The verse that I'm looking for, and some of you might know it, is the verse that tells us to cast down those thoughts. Sure, do you know how you have that, that verse for me? Four and five. Thank you. That's correct. You win the prize. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to read that for me? You said four or five? Second, second Corinthians 10. Sorry. All right. Are we there? Yeah. <laughs> three. Start for three. Go through five. Okay. For though we walk in the flesh... We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So when Satan brings a thought of pride to your mind. What are you supposed to do according to this verse? Cast it out. You're supposed to cast it out. How do you cast it out? Well, you don't let it penetrate. 
You don't let it penetrate, and how do you avoid that, Rich? Changing the channel? Yes. Yeah. All right. Exactly. You change the channel to what? Jesus Christ. To Jesus Christ. Christ. What do we, Christ. And who is Jesus? He's the Word, right? Yeah. So you cast it out with the Word of God. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. Now, what is the opposite of pride? We learned that tonight. Humility. humility. What does God say about humility? You're putting yourself... Putting others before yourself, right? You're thinking of yourself as, you know, and this is hard to do. You're thinking of yourself as less than the other person. That is a very difficult thing to do. Because all of our lives, we've been told to be proud of yourself, son. Right? And now Jesus is telling us to be low, to be humble. So what sense does that make? If we're going to... We're going to get beat to death out there in the street, right? If we go out in a humble state of mind, the thugs in the street will take advantage of you. Am I correct? Yes. So why would we listen to Jesus telling us to be low? We're supposed to be there with our chest out proud. Ah, I love that answer. But also there's power in the humility. Yes. It's great for the humble. He gives grace to the humble, and I would take grace any day. What is grace? It is God's unmerited favor, but it's a power. It's like Abraham says, it's a power. It's God's favor. Ever been on a freeway driving, and you knew you should have had an accident? Anybody? And God sent some angels? Am I, am I correct? And you, to this day, you can't figure out how in the world did I not have that accident. What is that called? Grace. That's called grace. That's called the favor of God. How many of you want more of that? All right? Well, if you want more of that, you need to exercise humility. You got that? James 4, 6 says he gives more grace to the humble. So instead of walking around being proud, now you need to walk around and find out how to become humble. Why? Because God will lift you up in due season. Mm -hmm. you have to give in order to Beg your pardon? You have to give in order to receive. There's a law there. It's a law of work. What's, the, what's that law called? It's a law of reciprocity. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Right? God says give mercy to others if you want mercy. The law of reciprocity, that's how God's whole system is set up. So if you want, if you're, if you're having financial problems, according to God's plan, what are you supposed to do? Give. You're supposed to give. Tithe. You get that? Not just tithe. Tithe belongs to God anyway. See, the t first 10% of everything you make, everything that you increase that you make, belongs to God. Did you guys know that? Yep. It's not yours. It, you don't have a decision to make whether you pay the light bill or pay your tithe. Right? But well, they don't cut my lights out. Well, okay. You got to pay your tithe. Does that make sense? Yes. Why? Because God promises to do what? Okay, where, where does he say that? Come on. He, did he say that? Huh? Turn to Malachi 3 real quick. Because you guys need to understand this. This law of reciprocity works. It works in finances. It works in relationships. If you want someone to be more loving to you, what do you got to do? You've got to give love. Amen? You want somebody to have mercy on you? You've got to give mercy to others. There's a parable in the Bible where Jesus forgave. He saw that the master forgave this one fellow who owed the money, but that same guy went out and was really harsh to another person who, who owed him money, and God said, we cast you out in, in Never Never Land, the national team. So he, there's, there's a principle at work here that I want you to get. And the same principle of reciprocity is the same thing that's at work with humility and pride. God wants you to be humble because why? He wants to do all the work. I want him to do the work for me. I don't know about you. I would love for him to do the work for me. 
Get out the way and let him do the work. That's all he's saying to do. And the way you get out the way, you submit to him on a daily basis. God, make my will line up with your will. Father, show me how to please you today. You get out the way, you submit to God. And then when you come into contact with other believers, when you come into contact with other people in the world, you put their needs before your needs. Wow. Wow, that's a different take on what, what's going on. Now we get Malachi 3. I need to, anybody, I need to you know, take a little excursion and show them this because right now this is a tough time in the economy. This has not been pretty this last five years for Americans and people all around the world. It's been really, really tough. Like, there's a song that says, if I ever needed God before, I sure do need him now. You guys know that song? Well, we need the Lord now, and right now we need to know how to access uh, the riches of God. So turn to Malachi. Malachi is the book right before the New Testament starts. Malachi 3, verse 8. Malachi 3, what? 3, 8. 3, 8. This is, this is very important because a lot of times, guys, we do things out of ignorance. We do things against God just simply not knowing. Okay? But we, we, you, the God says in his word, to much is given, what? Much is required. What does that mean? You have responsibility now. Before you didn't know. So you guys are in trouble now, because I'm about ready to show you. All right? Now you're going to know. Now you're going to be responsible. All right. So God said in Malachi, <clears throat> okay, you want to read for me, Mark? Sure. sure. Will a man rob God? You have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed for the curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the, the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Okay, stop. Wow, that's a major promise. Oh, he goes about the same testimony, right? So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. This is the only scripture in the Bible where God tells you to test him. If you test him in any other way, he will take you out. <laughs> ask, the, ask the Israelites. They tested him in the desert. He sent some snakes to bite him and kill him, because they tested him. But when it comes to money, he says, you test me. You pay your tithes and see that I want bless you, that I want fill your bonds. Now, I gotta tell you, and then he says, he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. If Satan's bothering you right now, and it seems like everything you do, you can't get that booger off your back, check yourself and make sure that you're tithing. Check and see that you're not robbing God. Because God will rebuke him for your sake. He'll take him out for you. There's a difference between tithing and offering. Right? Tithing is what belongs to God. Offering is what? It's coming from your heart. It's giving from your heart. Over and above your tithe. Now, the reason I brought all this up because I want you to understand this principle of reciprocity. When you give, it will be given unto you. And God's at work. Abraham said that when you humble yourself, there's a power at work. When you lift yourself up in pride, God will bring you down. Guaranteed. You ever watch these movie stars? You watch these people, these athletes? You watch these people who get raised up and they walk around boasting and prideful and it's not too long after that 
you'll see a major catastrophe in their life, a something major divorce, something's coming down the pipe. They've lifted themselves up, or they let the world lift them up. It's a law. But you see the ones that stay humble? They stay and they last forever. They just. And that's the same with the way the Lord wants us to work. So we want you to avoid pride. We want you to learn how to walk in humility. It takes some effort to walk in humility. It's not something that's going to come natural because you're not. When a baby is born, watch this. When a baby is born, God says in Psalms through David that you were sinful in your mother's womb. You believe that? So what did you do? You, didn't, you haven't even been born yet and you're already sinful. What happened? That's not fair. What's, what's up with that? Anybody know? All humans are sinners. All humans are sinners. Why? Okay, so Adam and Eve allow sin to come into a pure world. Yes, and so at that moment, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, the world, the universe, started on a decay. The world is sick, the universe is sick, and men used to live a thousand years, and now we can barely make it to 70 or 80. We've got all these diseases, and we're constantly Wickedness is ever increasing. It's getting more and more wicked in this world today. You guys believe that? Yeah. yeah. And you, have, you only have to live about 20 years to see the decline of the moral morality in this country and in this world today. And it's getting, it's going to get worse. So that sin that entered into the world, when Eve and, and Adam and Eve sin, is what in the flesh. So when these babies are born, they already have the pride built into the DNA. When that baby comes out, you ever try to take something away from a little baby? Huh? Yeah. You give him something and you try to take it away, what does he do? Right. He's pulling on it. It's mine. It's mine. I, I, I. And it, so it starts from birth. So we're, we, we go through life looking out for ourselves and not for others. But I'm, I'm here to tell you tonight to avoid pride, walk in love, walk in humility. And the, and the verse of the scripture that I'm going to give you to take with you tonight is that, well, three. One is uh, verse 16, 18, Proverbs 16, 18. This is the one you want to write down and memorize. And just remember this. Proverbs 16, 18? Yes, ma'am. While you're looking at that, I'm just going to read a couple more to show you what, how God can stand it. Try to bring that spirit. It's what you have to get rid of. You have to cast it down with the word of God, with good thoughts, and with speaking the word to it. God says in Psalms 10, 4, it brings... Pride brings the disgrace. He says in Proverbs 11, 2, it breeds quarrels. If you're quarreling with someone, stop for a minute. Have patience, which is love. Have love, have patience. Turn it around from arguing to being gentle and kind, and you'll see that pride spirit go away. You have the choice, you have the power, you have the ability to control those quarreling situations. And then it says in Obadiah 1 3, pride brings you low. And let me just say this, guys. God wants to love you. He wants you in a loving position. He don't, he doesn't, he hates to spank his children. It's just like a loving parent. He doesn't want you to have to, if he loves you so much, he would rather spank you than to see you go and destroy yourself. Like Satan, like Lucifer. <coughs> so that's why he allows these, these trials and tribulations in your life because he's trying to spank you and get you back in line. So here's the choice that you have. God loves you. 
you are his child. He will allow you to humble yourself first. Or if you keep acting out, he'll humble you himself. He'll allow <coughs> Satan to humble you. You get that? Yeah. So when you find yourself being arrogant and proud and you find that there's just so much turmoil in your life, you just stop and look at yourself. Was I proud for today? Did I put others before myself in humility? Did that comment that I made hurt that other person's feelings? What can I do to be a blessing to someone today? These are the things that you want to become as a humble person. Amen? So you got that verse 16, 18, Howard? Yes. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Right. So if you're walking around all haughty and I'm all that, it won't be long before you fall. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, thank you for this time that we have today to talk about pride and humility. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus and his humbleness, him being able to die on the cross for us. Lord, we want to take out of here tonight a, a spirit of humility. Teach us, strengthen our inner man, so Father, that we can learn to put others before ourselves. And Father, allow us to remember, starting tonight, starting tomorrow, Father, when we walk out, to go out and to do your will, to do something that's going to be a blessing. Use us, Lord. Use our hands and our feet and our mind for others. Father, forgive us for all the pride for things that we've done. Forgive us for the pride that we've had with our parents, the pride we've had with our siblings, our co-workers, Father. Father, we've even seen nations fall because of prideful leaders all over this world. All they had to do was repent. Repent like Hezekiah did, Father. When he was in his pride, he repented. You gave him 15 more years to live, and you Bless their land. So, Father, today we come to you repenting, asking for forgiveness for our pride. We ask you to lift us up, Father, as we seek humility in you. Lord, we do love you. We praise you. It's in the matchless name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. All right. <clears throat> I want to say a few things real quick uh, before we go into the festivities of uh, two birthdays and anniversary. You know, one, as Willie was speaking, it just really spoke to me about myself. I think a lot of us look to pride and we think that pride is something like that's so outward. You know, like, hey, I'm not being so prideful. Or, hey, look, I'm really trying to to not show that I'm better than this person, but I want to say a couple things briefly, because it is kind of early. I've seen more people come to Christ by humbling yourself and encouraging somebody else. For myself, I'm, I'm naturally very competitive. And so I've, for a very long time, walked around somehow wanting to show that I'm better or that I'm faster, or that I'm, I'm stronger than something or someone, or no more than somebody. And even though we look a lot of the times to the outward appearances, I, th I think you mentioned prior that the very first sin that's announced is the fall of Satan is pride. Most everything stems from pride itself. And because of my natural competitiveness, naturally, even if I'm not really trying so hard to show that I'm better, and now I'm kind of like supposedly humbling myself, but deep down I'm trying so hard to, to give a little clue that I'm better. It's mental for me. And I think we all naturally do that, but like Willie was saying, we think of Jesus Christ on the cross, okay, God coming down, dealing with agony, fine. But I want you to think for a second this. This all-powerful God I mean, the creator of the universe instantly takes the form of man and is encouraging and loving each person. Not just 
just a physical death. I mean, Jesus Christ took on humility. <coughs> he washed the people's feet. Not at all expressing how he's God so powerful. So after his death. Then he says, Abe, hey, come follow me. Okay. And try not to be prideful, so competitive. Or hey, I gave that. Or hey, I did that. Or matter of fact, I know a little more than you. And I don't have to say my own words or my actions. And he says, I look at your heart, the intent. Do you want to raise yourself up? Or do you want to lift up others to me? And so if you want to see change in life, it's not just your physical outward appearance or what you're saying and what you're doing, but it's your mental thoughts. Hey, I look better than this person. I'm dressed a little bit better. And I want them to know without me saying it. It's those tiny little details in our heart that destroy it, this poison. I mean poison. Now, a little bit of compromise. A little bit of compromise. And I want to say that because we're looking at the word pride. And we look at only certain angles. But reality is, it's the innermost depth of us that we have, to, that we have our struggles. And God says, release it before me. Like Willie said, just surrender, knowing that the ultimate purpose for your life Less of you and more of me. Less of you, Abe, and more of me. You know, one of my, and not to anyway brag or boast about anyone, and this person actually hates it, but Eric, we work out the gym all the time, and man, I see this man who has strength, I mean, he has a lot going in a sense, that I'm like, this man is constantly encouraging me, pushing me, building me, and I'm like, you know, wow, so impactful. And it's like, it's those little small little things that you say and you do that you, and that you exalt God and you show them, hey, you can do it and less of me. It's so powerful. It's drawing me closer to God just by someone's awesome words of, hey, Abe, you're awesome, man. And I know this person can blow me away. But yet he's just like boosting me up. And I'm like, I feel better. Like, I feel so more in tune with God. Like, I want to do more spiritually. There's a power in that. A power in that. And I see others and they're, they're so about them, about my feelings, about my thoughts. And I'm like, man, I feel so bad for those people. And I'm just like praying for them. And rather than telling them, how do you tell a pride person, a person that's prideful, hey, you have a lot of pride in you. How do you do that? It's like you, it's like it's an oxymoron almost to that person. But you gotta show them, lead them. Encourage them, pray for them. And a lot of times that pride is in our stuff. You know, it's it's a it's a process we go through. The closer that we draw to Christ, the less of us, the more of him. You see your life just it just blows your mind. I mean it blows your mind. You become more content, you just see God in all these things, your life just becomes more vibrant. And like Willie was saying, God will humble you. And I pray he doesn't have to. Because when God does something, he does it drastically to wake us up. He does. You have a question? I do. Yeah. What's the difference between excellence and pride? Excellence and pride? Yeah. Like we're trying, is there something wrong with trying to reach? Uh, that's a good question. Well, well I think for me. Trying to reach excellence. Oh. Well, you want me to pride or me? Excellence. That, you know, I think one of the things is this. When you there's nothing wrong with being the best that you can be. But you do it for the honor of God, not for man. Yeah, right? True. And so when I'm doing my best, and I'm like, God, I want to be better for you. Not to have others look at me and lift me up and say, God, I'm doing this for you. God sees that as your heart, and, you, and God will raise you up. Because you, because you want to exalt Him. Not yourself from people. And when, that's why when God says, hey, look, it, when you give, and you want people to see you give, He goes, there's your glory. Man gave you your honor, not me. Because you want others to see it. And you want to be known. You want to say how good you are at something? There's your honor. Not from me. You have your honor. But when you do it in secret before your body, God, I just want to make the best thing for this person, 
not so I can look good, because I want to know that I love you and I do it because I want to do my best for you as if I'm giving it to God himself. He says, do all things unto God. When I'm, when, when I'm here talking, giving a service or giving a sermon, I'm not, yeah, I'm doing it for you, but I'm doing it for God first. Out of love for you. When I'm, when I'm there helping you clean your house or helping you with business, I'm doing it for Him, to show a little love for Him to you, and I will give the best service to you, best as I can, because I do it as if I'm doing it for God. And you change that mentality in your life, and like He was saying, it comes back to you tenfolds. Tenfolds. And there's a scripture that says, do all things heartily as unto the Lord. So if you're working, or you're playing, or whatever you're doing in life, do it heartily. Do it from your heart. Do it with all your strength. Not just in excellence for yourself, Richard, but you're doing it as unto the Lord. You know, Jesus and, and John uh, made a statement about why he was doing these miracles. And he wasn't doing it for himself. He said he was doing it for the glory of God. So that God could be glorified. You know, there's nothing like a Christian woman, a Proverbs 31, is it? A 31. Proverbs 31. Is it? Thank you, yeah. thank you, Shul. There's nothing like a woman who is beautiful in spirit. Does it really matter what she looked like on the outside? Right? But when she carries herself in the spirit of the Lord, you can see just the, 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 the glow, the light, because she's doing it according to the Lord. But that's the way we should carry ourselves in everything that we do. When we're at work, Richard, when we're doing things excellent, and we're calling ourselves Christian. Who's getting the glory? People are saying, you know, there's something about that dude, Richard. I don't know what it is. But everything he does, he does it to perfection. And guess what? He never says, utters a one word of boasting or taking credit. Or any, what's up with that dude? You're doing it for the glory of God. They see Jesus in you. Mm -hmm. So whatever occupation we have, we yes. try for excellence. Is that correct? Say it again. When we have an occupation, we strive for excellence. You strive for excellence. Okay. But unto the Lord, though. It's but unto right. the Lord. So I'm saying. T, you have a question? Yeah, I, uh, I recently read a, read a book called uh, Every Man's Back. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the book, it tells the difference between excellence and obedience. Excellence is man trying to strive to outdo each other and try to do the best that they can do. Where obedience, there is no higher uh, work for God or anything that's above obedience. So we're supposed to be striving for obedience. Well, being obedient and excellence for the same purpose. That's right. That's right, for the same purpose. But man's, man's idea of excellence is it's not amongst each other versus for God to run. Right. Yeah. It's like playing blackjack. You want to table with everybody, but it's really between you and the dealer. It's not between you and everybody else. Right. And, and so when you think about it that way, it's like God says, listen, why are you doing it? You know what? And the reality is not just occupation. I mean, literally everything that we do, everything that we do. And once we, and as we mature, we grow, we're into God's word, you, you'll start seeing your life becoming that way. Yeah. And hey, you know, I, I challenge you guys to go out tomorrow and wake up in the morning, submit your will to God's will. Ask God to show you how to be humble today. And go out and the first person you see, think of that person as better than yourself. Think of that person as the, how can I be a blessing to you? And watch your life change. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
So finally, Hanny's here, by the way. Pleasure's birthday. Happy birthday. 29 or 30? 29 or 30? 28. You guys don't mind? Uh, actually, I'm 35. I know your math isn't that great. You guys are doing better. But, uh, you know, this is the happy birthday to Hanny. You guys don't mind? And then for Julie. And we can do it in here or outside. Why are you sitting here? You guys don't mind. We all have to pinch Hanny's cheek on the way out. Oh yeah! Right. 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 Ready, one, two, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Henry. Joy. Happy birthday to you. Outside for Julie with the cake and Hanny. And so please join us. If you guys need prayer at all, any questions, we're up here.